so unpredictable. And I think maybe we should add technology to that list. Um, my apologies for the glitch earlier on. And many thanks to Ole and his colleagues on SIG2 for stepping up and, uh, and helping us out. Um, so I'll just begin my presentation then. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is John Clavin, uh, and I'm currently the acting governor of the Irish Prison Service College. And today, on behalf of my colleagues on the special interest group on leadership and management training, I'm going to give you an overview of our, our work and uh, an update on our progress to date. Uh, as mentioned, I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues on the leadership and management training SIG. And here we have a photograph of the uh, what well, was a rare moment of inactivity uh, on our from this hardworking group. Uh, from the left, we have Anne Christian Staff from the Swedish Prisons and Probation Service. And Christian is head of section at one of Sweden's six competence centers and has responsibility for leadership and management training. Next to Anne Christian is Nadia Kungel from the Swiss Prison Staff Training Center. And Nadia also has responsibility for leadership and training. You then have myself. And as I mentioned, I'm currently the governor of the Irish Prison Service College. And I oversee all operations and training in the college here, including management training. Next to me is Nadia Radkovska from Bulgaria. And Nadia is the head of the International Cooperation and Training Department. And she's also the vice chair of the Council of Criminological Cooperation at the Council of Europe. And last but by no means least, we have Smelter Baranchek. Smelter is the director of training center at the Croatian Prison Service Directorate. So as you can see, we comprise a broad geographical spread, which brought great diversity of practice to our group and made them for some very, very interesting discussions. So we began our work in mid-October uh, at the first of what were three scheduled meetings in Copenhagen. Uh, unfortunately, we were only able to realize two of the three scheduled meetings uh, due to the small matter of COVID-19. Uh, however, the two meetings did manage to achieve, that we did manage to achieve, proved to be very productive and were really essential to, uh, to the progress that we have made to date. Uh, the first question, I suppose, that we had to decide at our initial meeting was who was our target audience? And I know this might seem like a strange question regarding what, on the face of it, appears to be a very straightforward topic. However, during our discussions, we debated the terms leadership and management. And it became apparent that they didn't have the same meaning for all countries. For some, there was no difference between leadership and management. The terms were interchangeable. But for others, they were distinctly different, where management referred to a position within an organization's hierarchy, whereas leadership could be found at all levels of an organization, from the most junior staff member to the most senior. And so after discussion uh, at our meeting, we arrived at the following consensus for our target audience. So we decided that the cohort of prison managers who are responsible for the strategic and operation of the prison, uh, in particular, the project is aimed at prison governors and directors and their deputies in the senior management team. However, it was also hoped that the project would be of assistance in developing training for staff who had been identified as future uh, leaders of their organization. So like the other SIGs, uh, we, too, had the uh, three outputs. Um, we had the comparison group practice, minimum standards, and the handbook. Um, but I, I suppose in terms of the output one, we changed the title from, from best practice to good practice. Uh, and the reason for this was that due to the limitations on time and resources and constrictions on the size of the output, we didn't really feel that we could proclaim best practices without actually having evidence to back this up. We did, however, observe in, in the documentation lots of what could justifiably be called good practice. And hence, the output changed from best practice to good practice. The final draft of that document uh, is complete. Um, and as is the final draft of a minimum standard. 
due to a number of factors, uh, and not least the uh, previously mentioned COVID-19 situation, the final output, our handbook, is remains a work in progress. So in terms, uh, and in relation to the, the group in comparison good practice, uh, the methodology that we employed as a group to, to devise this output was to study documents and to deliver presentations within the group on our own leadership training from our own uh, training academy. We also, also utilized the output from the EPSA conference of 2017 in Switzerland, which, was, uh, which had as its topic uh, leadership training. Um, this very recent data then, so I, I, actually I'll go to that report. Then we also sent a request to update the data, and we had extensive discussions um, both at our two meetings and also at the various um, virtual meetings that we had. Um, so yes, I suppose just going back there, central to the first output was the comprehensive data which was provided by different training centers from across Europe for the EFTA conference of 2017, which as I mentioned, was held in Switzerland and had as its theme leadership training and training for prison probation managers. This very recent data was augmented by updated data in response to requests for time from our group. What became apparent from the data was the very different context and variation in the approaches to leadership and management training. And so, as you can imagine, this pr proved very challenging to us as a group when we attempted to, to produce suggestions for our second output, the minimum standards. The final document contains an outline of programs from nine countries. And these are those that are listed on the screen now, which are Croatia, Finland, France, Ireland, the Netherlands, Norway, Slovakia, Sweden, and Switzerland. However, this is not to be interpreted as meaning that these countries produce the best leadership and management training. As we mentioned earlier, our outputs are limited by size, and these countries were selected purely on the basis of the amount of data that was available. And we in the SIG, we would like to recognize and thank all of the training centers that provided data, either in 2017 and or subsequently. We received data from approximately 18 countries. So once we decided on the, the countries that were going to be included in our output, we set about uh, constructing the document. And this was how the document was laid out. So we, we looked at the target group from each country, the contents of the training course, the methodologies and, and pedagogical approaches, the duration of the, the various different courses, how frequently they were run, whether they were accredited or not accredited, and whether they included any innovative practices. And so to briefly summarize the findings and learnings from, uh, from the comparison, um, and we're just going to lay out just a few of, of what we found under the following headings. So in terms of uh, design and implementation of training programs, we found good practice in countries uh, which combined formal training and action learning. Another good practice I identified was the complementing of traditional training with an opportunity to practice the new knowledge within the real environment by rotating, shadowing, uh, experiential learning. And we also found that theory-based course lectures were being replaced with interactive learning. And it was also obvious, uh, uh, an obvious good practice that we identified is where countries were implementing a learning system which provided uh, development opportunities for the lectures and feedback system. In terms of accredited training and collaboration with academies, we found that some countries chose to have accredited training. Adding accreditation to in-house training can have lots of benefits, but I suppose it's not really reason for everybody. Uh, we found that good practice is a combination of internal and external resources to deliver program content. The blend of internal and external 
provides participants with the opportunity to compare and contrast different perspectives. The selection of the target group. Again, we found here that a good practice in some countries was to not necessarily just go with the one level of, 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 uh, of uh, audience. So for instance, there was a mixture of the various levels from the reviews at, at different levels of the, the hierarchy, and not just just leaving it with culinary or basic wage staff, but there was a mix so that everybody gets an understanding of everybody else's role. Integrated programs, including both management and leadership training. So again, good practice in some countries uh, where it was identified where they had chosen to offer training, which focused on both good leadership and management skills. So I suppose with leadership, um, the, the, the key to leadership skills is that, you know, that people recognize the, that leaders need to be adaptable um, and based on the situation, based on themselves or the role that they're, they're asked to perform. And then management skills uh, are also really important. So there's a planning and organizing, leading and coordinating. Again, further good practices were identified where countries had chosen training based on blended learning. So lectures, seminars, exercises, face-to-face, -face, online learning. Uh, we found examples of interactive learning and practice-oriented learning. Implementation by a pilot program. So we identified a good practice in countries uh, where who use pilot program to secure successful implementation of leadership training. The pilot enables valuable evaluation during and after the program. The pilot program can successfully be used in taking forward steps in establishing leadership training. And then finally, the final heading was the potential program. So good practice in countries uh, were considered the potential programs as a source of developing internal leadership talent among the staff and sides in other areas of the organization. The programs can ensure a flow of newly identified competent leaders with core skills who have the capability to advance to a critical position or higher level of responsibility. And then we moved on to our second output, which was minimum standards. And the rule of law, I suppose, in simple terms means that neither an individual nor the state or its agents are above the law. This is a critical element of democracy. The state cannot interfere with the liberty of an individual unless the law confirms the legitimate authority to do so. As such, it's incumbent on the state to ensure that those entrusted with such great responsibility are properly trained and equipped to carry out their duties within not only the uh, literal legal framework, but also within the spirit of the law. In order to achieve this objective, output two sets out our objectives, or our suggestions for minimum standards for the design and content of the leadership and management training program. The basis of this document is provided by the Council of Europe guidelines regarding recruitment, selection, education, training, and professional development of prisons and probation staff. On the United Nations stand, uh, Standard Minimum Rules for the Treatment of Prisons, also known as the Mandela Rules, and on the European Prison Rules as amended. So we've decided to divide the, the minimum standards into two distinct parts. Firstly, the minimum standards in relation to the, the function and structure of an organization. Um, the, the, and then secondly, uh, minimum standards with regard to some core content. And here we have our outline, the, the elements of uh, the organization elements of the minimum standards. I'm not going to, to elaborate on them all because they can be, when the document is produced, they'll be there for everybody to see. But I'd just like to, to maybe pick out one or two of the list that we have here and just to a little bit on it. So in terms of core induction, uh, the timing of leadership and management training differs from country to country. For some, this training takes place prior to the appointment to a promoted position, uh, while for others, it follows uh, after selection of a successful candidate. 
And then I suppose for further still, there's little or no formal training. And newly promoted staff are expected just to pick it up as they go along. Regardless of any country's practice, newly promoted managers and leaders should receive a power induction training program immediately on appointment, if not immediately before. And the purpose of a core induction is to provide a clear outline of the role that the inductee has been appointed to. To articulate the organization's mission, vision and values and how the employee's new role fits within this framework. And to give a clear understanding to the new appointee of the terms and conditions of the new role and to provide an understanding of key policies and legislative responsibilities. In terms of needs analysis, the identification of training needs should be a first step when developing prison leadership management training program. Various methods can be employed to conduct a needs analysis, such as direct observation, questionnaires, consultation with persons in key positions or who have specific knowledge, interviews, workshops, assessment studies, and as we had earlier on, a little uh, uh, lesson in managing critical incidents. Um, other areas which we have included in the organizational aspects of the minimum standards are the structure and planning of the training program, competency-based training, the quality of the trainers, uh, which I, I see we have in common with our C2 colleagues, uh, as well as training evaluation and interagency training. In terms of the training content, um, I suppose the intention of our SIG group uh, on this project was never to be prescriptive with regard to the content of any leadership and training, uh, management training course. That's the responsibility of each prison service or training centre. However, there were a number of topics which we believe should form the basis of all leadership and management training and should be universally included. With that in mind, we produced the second part of our minimum standards content. And again here, I'll just pick out one or two of these topics uh, and elaborate a little bit. But uh, again, the rest of the members, the narrative on those can be seen in our, our document when it's produced. So understanding leadership. Prisons with the most humane regimes, which demonstrate a, a strong compliance and governance culture, which are safe and secure, are likely to be those with the most informed and confident leadership. Key to ensuring and enhancing this is understanding what leadership means. Does one size fit all situations? Are there different types of leader? Or what does it actually mean to be a leader? All leadership and management training courses should contain a module on the theoretical aspects of leadership. They should explore different models and schools of leadership thought in order to allow the participants to reflect on their own practice and their own leadership style. Human rights focus. In order for a prison to operate in a fair and humane manner, leaders and managers have a duty to ensure that all those deprived of their liberty are treated with dignity and respect in compliance with various human rights instruments. Council of Europe guidelines clearly set out the requirement to include human rights training, where it states, training for prison staff should include international and regional human rights instruments and standards developed in the framework of the United Nations and the Council of Europe in order to ensure that prisons are managed to consistently high standards uh, that are in line with international, regional and national human rights. The other topics which are contained in our minimum standards training context would be understanding the political uh, context for the, the civil public servants, the professional ethics and values, strategic staffing, staff development, and equality and diversity for both staff and for prisoners. Prison leadership calls for a range of highly developed competencies, underpinned by core values, professional commitment, and an ability to motivate and inspire. It has to be recognized that good prison management is complex and dynamic. It is a continuous process, and comprehensive and relevant training should be provided to 
to support leaders to identify the challenges that are required in their own environment and to reflect on the challenges. There is no gold standard. Leadership and management training differs from country to country. The set of minimum training star, uh, standards may encourage a more effective and efficient prison management. And finally, then, just to move on to uh, the handbook. Uh, as I stated earlier, um, due to uh, the COVID, uh, well, not least due to COVID, um, our handbook is still a work in progress. We have created a structure, uh, which we have outlined here, uh, and I'll briefly go through the structure. Um, so we will obviously have an introduction to the handbook, uh, which will give the background to the project, rationale for leadership and management training, uh, and an overview of the handbook structure and content. We'll then move into a chapter on managing the project. Um, so topics included in that will be, for instance, who will have ownership for the course development, what resources are available, what additional resources are required, and what are the timelines that need to be set in order to get this need to manage the training. We then have a, a chapter on accreditation and structure. Um, and we look at the advantages and the disadvantages of accreditation because accreditation is not always the answer. Um, yes, it might be for some, but not for all. Uh, we will also look at partnering with external providers. And that's something that we do in the Irish Prison Service, and we bring in outside agencies to deliver some training for our staff. And then we, then there's a, the, the, the other topic in there is considering appropriate structure for your organization. We then go on to, to consider methodologies. So for instance, blended learning methodologies, what is most suited to your own individual needs and what is achievable? That needs to be you know, really, really thought out. Uh, we then also have conducting a needs analysis. Uh, this is identifying the target group and considering the competencies for each of these uh, groups. Program content, um, we have outlined some that we feel uh, should be in there and we will probably put those into to the um, to the, to the handbook, um, but also for, for, for your own organization, you need to consider what are the topics and what, uh, and in order to, to, I suppose, make them, uh, to ensure that they're relevant, you need then to identify the learning outcomes from the, the, the topics that you uh, Program design is another chapter, chapter where there'll be samples of various methods uh, of delivery. Consider the option uh, where cross-border training is, is, is an option for you, and also to consider interagency training. And then again, another common theme which seems to be coming up in, in handbooks and in the standards is the area of quality assurance and evaluation. So testing the quality of what you deliver, and also testing the effectiveness from a, a learner's perspective. So I think that's, um, that's where we are at the moment. Um, thanks very much for your patience uh, at the, the start. And um, I hope this is of some value to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for your presentation. Um, so John and uh, his fellow special interest group members, Nadja Pinto, on 15 uh, staff, Dr. Latkowska and Smilka Baranchek will be able to answer some questions. I think there are some connection uh, issues for Anki staff, but the rest is here um, to give some insight. So uh, let's see. I think, Peter, you had a question uh, first, right? Okay, thanks, Lisa. Uh, actually, uh, I remember uh, when uh, preparing this uh, um, this module or, or this training, leadership and management training, and we were discussing what competencies, what leadership skills uh, should be somehow um, chosen to be trained. 
And I think somehow we we were able and we managed to uh, to choose. And then uh, at the beginning of, of uh, March, I think uh, it was more more or less um, defined. However, then COVID came, and my question is if that situation and how the, the managers of prisons have to react on the COVID, if that fact or that uh, experience anyhow changed the, that, uh, the skills needed for management and leaders of the prisons? Um, I, I suppose from my perspective, um, you know, the, the co current COVID crisis really just, I suppose, serves to, to to engage uh, the, the skills of, of leaders in terms of, you know, their decision-making abilities, their critical thinking skills, um, you know, how they operate in the prison in terms of the preparedness and operating and their teamwork. So I, I suppose really it, it's just, I don't think that the current COVID situation created a need for new skills. It certainly required people to, to draw on all their experience in, in how they, they utilize the skills that they have. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Does any of the other um, group members have anything to add to this? Hi, everyone. It's a pity I can't meet you, but nice to see some of you on the screen. Um, I agree with John. I also think that it's uh, skills that we need to teach uh, managers anyway, but I think this crisis gave us a good example. So in our leadership training now, we just took take this example in different topics we treat anyway, but um, it adds like a new way of exercising, a new way of, of um, discussing crisis management. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, I have a, a next question then. Um, considering leadership and management are often so dependent on personal leadership styles or uh, organizational culture or a specific jurisdiction that you are working uh, within, um, how did uh, this affect the development of the minimum standards and the handbook? Um, perhaps, Nadja uh, Ratkowska, can you give some insight on this? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you yes. see me? Another yes. question. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for this authorization. It was not easy without voice and uh, without face. <laughs> um, so thank you very much uh, for the extremely important uh, question, actually, Lizanne. And uh, I would like also to thank to my colleague, John, for the very extremely comprehensive way uh, he described our work during the, the last uh, month. Uh, it was not easy, actually, even um, because uh, the different, um, as you said, Lizanne, different management styles, different uh, organizational values we have across Europe. As uh, my colleague John mentioned in his presentation, we, uh, in our um, special interest group, we uh, have represented different um, uh, geographical region in Europe, but also different cultural dimensions. And uh, from my uh, personal observation, uh, there are um, many, many challenges in this uh, context. For example, uh, what I, I observe is that there are different uh, understanding across uh, Europe regarding the role of prison managers and prison leaders. Actually, who are they? Uh, who do we recognize as prison managers and prison leaders? This is very much connected to our work because we decided to start by defining who are those people. And uh, we have um, actually tried uh, to, to compare and to combine the different practices into 
um, into one definition. And maybe we are right, maybe we are wrong, uh, we'll see. Another issue connected to your question, um, Lizan, is the fact that we have observed that uh, there are some controversies regarding the recruitment process of uh, prison uh, leaders and prison managers across Europe. Um, actually, it's not easy to find the public information about the recruitment process of uh, prison leaders and prison managers. Um, another issue uh, connected with uh, your question is the different insight that uh, we have regarding the role of training for good prison management uh, and uh, good prison leadership. But um, actually, uh, we have um, uh, we have uh, benefit from all these uh, diverse uh, leadership uh, styles and um, diverse um, role of the managers across uh, Europe. And I think that um, we have tried to find maybe not the gold standard, but some kind of balance to be useful for the different countries as good uh, practical advices and uh, standards, of course. Thank you, Nadia. I think that's a very uh, important insight that you share. So thank you for your elaborate answer.